Dear friends in Christ, I invite you to please join me in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for blessing us with your Son, Christ Jesus, who is the Word made flesh. We thank you that he has given us the promise of salvation, and we can trust that promise both now and forever. We pray that truth, that promise, may fill our hearts with the comfort and hope that one day we will spend eternity with you. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Today, as we've mentioned, I don't know how many times we are celebrating the Reformation. And as we talk about the Reformation, as we think about the reforms that Martin Luther made on the church, the, the work that he did, he didn't set out to actually completely change the church as he did, but that is the way the Spirit led him. That is the way God had, what God had in mind for his life. To go out and to change the church so that they would know the promises and truths of God's Word. Now this is really important for us because as we think about what Luther did, he was leading the church back to truth. He was leading the church back to a place that they'd wandered far from. Truth had been philosophized. It had been, it had been studied. It had been taken and boiled down to a place that everybody could understand it. A place that, well, it fit between the ears. A place that it seemed like more of a concept than an object from God. This is important because as we think about truth today, we see how, how much truth has been conceptualized. We see how much truth has been placed into this idea, this, this uh, idea that our understanding, our viewpoints, our life experiences are what shapes truth. And let me kind of put this into, a, into perspective for you. If I were to tell you that it's comfortable in here, some of you would say, yeah, it is pretty comfortable in here. Some of you would say, no, it's too hot in here. Some of you, a few of you might say, no, it's a little cool in here. Now, all of you, you'd be being honest, wouldn't you? I would be being honest, although I would say it's hot personally, but I would be, we would all be honest. But because of our truth, the, the way we view things, the way we experience things, truth has a different meaning for each of us. Now, that's a bit of an inane example. But this, where the rubber hits, meets the road, is when we talk about the way that truth affects our morality, the way that truth affects our politics, the way the truth affects our faith life. Now, if we go way back to, all, all the way back to when Jesus was about to be crucified, Pontius Pilate asked a very interesting question. And it's one that I think we wrestle with even to this day. Jesus said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. End of John chapter 18. And then right after that, Pontius Pilate said to him, what is truth? Have any of you ever asked that question, what is truth? In this day and age, it could be different for different people, right? In this day and age, truth is in the eye of the beholder. Maybe another example would be good here. When I went to high school, they had a dress code. Very strict dress code because I was at Lutheran school. They had certain requirements that you had to meet. One of the things I remember was, of course, that I always had my, have my shirt tucked in. But the other thing I remember was the fact that they had a, a dress code remi requirement for how short a, sh a, a girl's shorts could be or a skirt could be. And they actually had nine inches. So the vice principal would walk around with his ruler, and he would check. And if they thought that if one of the teachers or he thought one of the, the, the skirt was too short, they would measure it. Now... For some of you, you hear nine inches and you say, well, that's pretty lenient. That's in, the, you know, in this day and age, that's, you, you can see shorter. Uh, some of you, you're saying, how dare they let them get away with that? That's, uh, that's a sign of loose morals. Some of you might say that's too rigid, that, it should be, that they shouldn't be enforcing that type of thing. Again, the example is fairly inane, but you can see how, depending on your perspective, truth changes. Now, that's scary when we actually think about that. I gave you two inane examples, but when we talk about God's Word, when we talk about what God has given us in His Word, if we start to measure truth, the truth of God's Word, by that same scale, the promise of Scripture falls apart. If we start to measure Scripture by that same level of truth, we discover that there is no truth. And this is what Martin Luther discovered. This is why one of the keystone points of the Reformation was that Scripture had become something that was shaped and molded and formed depending on who it was. And he brought about the return to Scripture being God's Word alone. 
God's word alone. God's word did not come from tradition. God's word did not come from opinion. God's word did not come because a lot of guys sat down in a room together and said, well, this book should be here, this book shouldn't be. God's word came by, God, by the Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. God's word came to us by his promise, his guidance, by his Holy Spirit. And let me just read to you from what Paul says to young pastor Timothy, his second letter. All scripture is God-breathed, and it is useful to, for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in all righteousness. So aside from all those other things that the word is good for, it is God-breathed. The word of God, the Bibles that we hold, they are not simply words on a page. They are not simply bound together texts that are good advice for life. They are his living, breathing word to us. Let's go back to the very beginning of John. John chapter 1. The very first verse, John says, I am, John says about Christ, I am the way, the truth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word of God to us is Christ Jesus. And if that's not clear enough, he says it a little later. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory and the glory of one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Where I'm going with this, folks, is that we cannot know Christ without Scripture. We cannot know truth without Scripture. And when we, put tr when we put Scripture on that same level of truth as we put the concepts of this world, we lose all truth. Truth suddenly goes out the window and it just becomes a concept and an opinion. And this is what has happened in our world today. This is what is happening where we hear people who say, well, what's right for you is right for you. What's right for me is right for me. They can say that. It's not because they're against the church. It's because they understand truth as a concept and not as God's objective word to us. Well, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. There is no way to the Father but by me. John 14, verse 6. If we don't have truth, we don't have Christ. God's word is a different truth to us. It is the truth that shapes all other truth and forms our lives. It forms who we are. Now our friends, our friends in the Jehovah's Witness congregations, they have a hard time with these verses that we just read. They have a hard time because it says that Jesus is God. But if we don't have, if, and therefore scripture is from God. Well, it's not just the teaching of God. It is God's word. And this is really important because we know it to be God's truth and His promise, His righteousness and holiness to us. There's a great many different perspectives out there. But when we hold to Scripture as truth, we realize that it shapes and norms our entire lives. It doesn't just shape our church lives. It doesn't just shape our communities. It shapes all of our lives, wherever we may be. And when we think about God's Word being truth, it also is a bit uncomfortable. Because you know what else it does is it shows us what is right and what is wrong. It shows us that there is a right and there is a wrong. It shows us that even though society may talk about no rights and no wrongs or subjectively speak of it, Scripture shows us that there is a right and there is a wrong. God, there are things God calls sin. God calls sin lying. He doesn't make a, a judgment between whether or not it's a little white lie or a, a, a half-truth. A lie is a lie, and it is wrong. God doesn't say, even though the rest of society is okay with husbands or men and women living together before they are husband and wife, He doesn't say, well, because society says it's okay, it's okay. He says, no, that is wrong. I have designed the marriage bed to be kept pure between husband and wife. God doesn't say that it's okay to overeat and to overdrink and to become gluttons and drunkards. His word says no. We are to honor the bodies he has given us. We are to honor the lives he has given us. And even more than that, God's word shows us that not only do we sin, but we are sinners. That even if you can escape from one sin or another, that we are still slaves to our sin. God's Word shows us the truth in our lives that even if we were able to stop sinning for one day, that we are still sinful by nature. We, our hearts are polluted and made dirty, filthy 
nasty. We just heard it in, from Romans. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have broken God's law. And James makes it even a little more uncomfortable for us because he says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. I don't know about you, but that makes me a little uncomfortable. Because you think about, that numbers us among murderers, among thieves. It it numbers us among Satanists, among those who mock God, who blaspheme blaspheme God. If we've even broken one law, we've broken the entire thing. Scripture shows us that truth. And as uncomfortable as it may be, it shows us that there's punishment for that sin as well. There is truly punishment for all sin. Eternal punishment. But thankfully, that's not where the story ends, is it? See, there's another thing that Scripture shows us that is so important to our lives, another truth, a promise that God's Word reveals to us. We go back to John chapter 8. Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. See, when we read those words, Jesus isn't talking about the law there. The law doesn't set us free. The law binds us. The law entangles us. The law places the chains over us. But when we are set free by the Son, we are set free by the Gospel. The gospel that is given to us in its purity and truth in Scripture. The gospel promise that Jesus did die on the cross for our sins. That Jesus did indeed keep His promise that was made before the foundations of the earth. That Jesus kept that promise. Gave His life for you and for me. And when the Son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. We have been set free indeed. We have been set free to live as the people of God. We have been set free not from Scripture. We've been set free by Scripture, by the promise and truth that Jesus came and kept the promises. We have been set free by the promise and truth that Jesus has kept the Word, that He has lived out and borne our sin. Even though He lived a perfect life, He paid the price for us. Now that's the truth of Scripture. That's the truth that we celebrate today. Not that we have a word that can be fashioned and formed. Not that we have a word that I'm telling you is true, or Martin Luther told you is true, or even that Paul told you is true. But we have a word that God told us is true. His word. His promise that we will one day, as He has paid for our sins, that one day He will call us to be with Him forever. Those are the promises of God's word. Those are why we can't exchange Scripture, why we can't exchange truth for a concept, for an idea, but why we hold to Scripture as truth. When Martin Luther realized this in the Reformation, it completely changed his outlook on life. Up to this point, he was a hopeless man. He was a faithful man, don't get me wrong, but he was a hopeless man. And then he read those words, not just that first part of Romans chapter 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then that second part too, but have been made righteous by Christ Jesus. You, brothers and sisters in Christ, have been made righteous by Christ Jesus. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word made flesh in your son Christ Jesus. We pray that it would, that your word may be our guide and may be our path each day. That it may show us the way through this life even as we have many questions, many many doubts, many concerns. Help us to know that your word is truth for our lives. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us for those times when we have turned our back on you. Those times when we have sought after other truths, things that were comfortable, more easy. Return us to your word and show us that while those things may seem easier, there's only one way to salvation through your Son, Christ Jesus. There's only one way for us to one day be with you forever, and that is through his death and resurrection. That is the promise we hold to. That is the promise of Scripture. That is the hope of the resurrection. In all things, we give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen.